everyone. I'd like to welcome everybody to this latest installment of Zoom with ZOA coming to you live from Detroit, Michigan or the Michigan area. This is Alan Jay, National Director of Outreach and Engagement here at ZOA. Title of this uh, current webinar is The Silencing of Pro-Israel Students on Campus and it's featuring Jesse Arm, political strategist. You'll hear much more about him as we move forward. The program today is going to run like this. Questions, there will be a Q&A after Mr. Arm speaks. The Q&A is going to be managed, moderated by a chat. If you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll find the Zoom chat feature. Please use the chat to ask your questions only. And if you have comments, please keep them pertinent to the subject of the webinar. We appreciate your cooperation. Please leave all microphones on mute and uh, we'll get to Q&A via the chat. At this point, I'd like to welcome uh, ZOA Michigan President Sheldon Freilich to say a few words. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Alan. I'd like to welcome everybody to this program. Uh, I'd also uh, like to uh, uh, welcome uh, uh, members of the Board of the Zionist Organization of America, also members of the Board of ZOA Michigan Region, uh, and also me members of the ZOA and uh, ZOA Michigan. Welcome. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm very proud to uh, be part of the ZOA, which has been at the forefront of fighting for uh, Jewish civil rights for over 120 years. Uh, you'll hear more about uh, the organization from Kobe Eretz, who will introduce our speaker. I'd like to introduce Kobe Eretz, who's our executive director for ZOA Michigan Region. Kobe has been uh, our executive director for uh, 10 years. He's a native Israeli. Um, he fought uh, uh, with the IDF. He was a sergeant in the IDF. Um, a very uh, knowledgeable, uh, the Israeli scene, uh, uh, growing up, uh, being born and growing up in, in Israel. And um, uh, uh, Kobe, uh, we're proud to have you with the ZOA and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Shell, and uh, thank you everybody at the uh, ZOA National Office for making this happen. So tonight's program is very, very important, especially uh, uh, at this time. The, the foundation of this discussion uh, is based on um, anti-Semitism. So in order to understand where we are today, it's important to look at the history of anti-Semitism and how it relates to today and how we can learn from the past uh, of, of what to do and what not to do um, against hate. So if you look at anti-Semitism, there are three major uh, types of anti-Semitism. The first one was that Jews were blamed for not, were, didn't accept Christianity. Um, and that, that followed uh, by 2,000 years of, um, 2,000 years of anti-Semitism in Europe. Uh, now, if you look at the history of Europe, Jews were expelled from every country in Europe. Uh, they were burned alive. There were blood labels. There, there were murders. Um, and whole communities were wiped out, um, eventually also in the Holocaust, where six million Jews um, uh, were murdered. Um, today, anti-Semitism is not that different, but um, it's, it's not, and not less dangerous, if not more. And the reason for that is back then in Europe, uh, you had the fascists and you had the Nazis, and they say they were proud of being racist. They were out of the, uh, they were uh, open about being racist. Um, however, today, um, a lot of the times, it's not just the white supremacists who are who are anti-Semitic. A lot of the times, it's the people who who uh, claim that they are for civil rights, that the, the, that they're part of the civil rights movement. Um, one of these movements is Black Lives Matter, and I don't know if you saw it today in the news, but one of the um, uh, football eagle in, Eagles um, team in Philadelphia, one of their players came out and said, th he thought he was quoting Hitler, he wasn't, but he, he said that, um, that Jews control the media and Jews will turn on America, um, and we have to be very worried about the Jews. Now, how does this happen uh, in this day and age? And the answer to that uh, lays, first of all, within the, I, I believe, within the Jewish community. 
For years since the Holocaust, since the end of the Holocaust, hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent, have been invested in educating about the Holocaust, educating about anti-Semitism, opening Holocaust museums all over the country, all, all over the world. But uh, this is not just a museum for history. This is a Holocaust museum. And anything to do with the Holocaust is to learn about how to prevent another Holocaust, how to fight anti-Semitism. And fighting anti-Semitism today um, is complicated because when you look at Black Lives Matter and we look, when you look at uh, organizations like uh, who, who call themselves progressive, a lot of times they will be against Israel and eventually against the Jewish people. If you look at the Women's March and if you look at Black Lives Matter, and other organizations. If you support Israel, you're not allowed to be part of the, these organizations. Now, standing up against, um, for standing up for what's right is not always easy. M most of the, a lot, a lot of the Jewish establishment today is, is supporting and promoting the social justice movement or progressive movement, um, even in the expense of ignoring anti-Semitism. So if you look at Black Lives Matter, they call Israel an apartheid state. Uh, they say that Israel a, a, creates a genocide in the Middle East. And also eventually, and, and when, you don't, um, when you don't tackle that, this issue, when you don't criticize them, uh, when they say um, criticism about Israel that is, that is wrong, that is anti-Semitic, eventually it will be uh, geared towards uh, Jews in America. The Jewish establishment has been ignoring uh, anti-Semitism in the past few years, uh, especially on college campuses. And one of the reasons is that they care so much to be part of this group, of this social movement group, um, that they will, they will tell you, if you come to them, and I spoke to uh, various leaders in the Jewish community, uh, whether it's uh, uh, certain rabbis or, or heads of organizations, and, and I told them, and I confronted them, and I said, why are you uh, supporting Black Lives Matter? Why aren't you going and telling them, hey, you're not supposed to say these things about Israel or these things about Jewish people? And what they tell me is that, yes, they don't agree with everything that they have to say, but they, they identify with their fight. Now, once this happens, this is a very de dangerous development because once a Jewish establishment is ignoring anti-Semitism and is looking the other way, then all these millions of dollars have, have been spent on, on Holocaust museums and, 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 anti, and education against anti-Semitism go, goes to waste. And you see this day, day in and day out on campus. Now, many students experience anti-Semitism for being pro-Israel. Many of them are silent. The reason for that is because, and, I, and, and, and I'm quoting uh, students when I say this, we had different cases of students who experienced anti-Semitism, but they didn't want to say anything because they felt that the Jewish community, the Jewish establishment is not behind them. Um, in the case of Jesse Arm, uh, I'm proud to say that Jesse uh, uh, didn't keep silent um, and he, he stood up for what's right. Jesse is a uh, political strategist um, and he graduated from University of Michigan and he um, was uh, very active on the pro-Israel front, and he advocated for Israel. And um, I, I won't tell his story because I want him to tell it. But what's important to know is that it's not always convenient and comfortable to stand up for what's right. And today, it's not it, people. Uh, Jewish, the Jewish establishment does not want to go against the social justice movement. Um, even in the expense of anti-Semitism. And this is where ZOA steps in. ZOA, a lot of times, will say what is not comf comfortable to say, what is not convenient to say, what, is, what people, many people think is not politically correct. But you know what? It's okay to be not politically correct if you stand up against hate. And we are there, ZOA is there against anti-Semitism. ZOA is there when, when the Iran deal was made with the um, Obama administration, and most of the Jewish establishment told us that we are just interfering, uh, but we stood there and we said, this is a wrong, the wrong thing to, to give billions of dollars to, to the uh, Iranian government. 
we were there to, to warn against the Oslo Accords, against most of the Jewish establishment, and we were there to warn against disengagement from Gaza, which ended up uh, causing thousands of rockets to be shot at um, Israel, Israel cities. Um, I urge you to, to keep support, supporting ZOA. Many times we were a lone voice, and, uh, and we need you. We need every one of you. So uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, hear Jesse. We're going to hear his story. We're going to hear his, his perspective. And at the end, we're going to take questions. So Jesse, go ahead. Cool. Uh, thank you, Kobe. Uh, so it's wonderful to join you all this evening. <clears throat> Over the years, I've done a fair amount of traditional speaking engagements, but you'll have to bear with me as this is the first time I'm speaking to a crowd of folks via Zoom. But I suppose that is the new normal, at least for the time being. Um, like Kobe said, my name is Jesse Arm. I currently work as a political strategist, government affairs consultant, and pollster. Uh, the firm I currently work with is a New York City-based technology company called Apple Cart. We're best known for powering the data operation behind Ohio Governor John Kasich's presidential campaign in 2016, and we've since worked on a wide array of campaigns, super PACs, and done work for private corporations as well, everyone from Blackstone to Boeing, uh, nonprofit groups as well, uh, seeking to utilize technology to win public affairs campaigns and fight through lobbying efforts. Um, my job within the firm is to basically keep the trains running on time and make sure things get done on time and under budget. Uh, in addition to that, I serve as a project manager and consultant on most of our right of center accounts and um, <clears throat> I uh, help our clients achieve their uh, campaigns uh, through driving through data-driven communications. Um, I've previously spent time working in the Capitol Hill offices of Senator Tom Cotton and former Representative Dan Beneshek in the Congressional Affairs Department of the Embassy of Israel in Washington, DC, uh, with the American Enterprise Institute, a uh, leading public policy think tank, and at ACG Analytics, which is a investment research arm and strategic consult uh, the investment research arm of a larger strategic consulting firm uh, run by Washington lobbyist and now Trump campaign advisor, David Urban. Um, I've also repeatedly written about issues connected to anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, and free speech. In the pages of the New York Times, the Jerusalem Post, the Times of Israel, the Michigan Daily, and in the 2018 book, Anti-Zionism on Campus, the University, Free Speech, and BDS which was published by Indiana University Press. I've spoken on these topics on NPR, uh, with, on their show 1A with Joshua Johnson, and I've talked on radio shows like the Lars Larson Show, but, but today I'm here to talk to you about something challenging that happened to me almost five years ago now, uh, something that received international media attention and more scrutiny than any 19-year-old really knows how to deal with. Um, I'm here to talk to you about how the ZOA, as well as like-minded organizations, helped me overcome that challenge, um, and how I believe that experience, as well as the countless others like it, impact the issues that American Jews, and obviously the much wider pro-Israel community, face today. On Thursday, November 19th of 2015, two Palestinian terror attacks occurred in Israel. In the early days of what would become a, a months-long terror spree, called by some the knifing intifada. Among the three people butchered in one of those attacks on that day was an 18-year-old American Jewish student studying abroad by the name of Ezra Schwartz. Ezra was a contemporary of mine, a traditional Jewish kid from a uh, town that wasn't New York and who was, you know, my age. He was a member of my broader community and a guy who I shared many mutual friends with. He was abroad on a gap year program that I had seriously considered attending before eventually electing to enroll at the University of Michigan, which is my alma mater. For all intents and purposes, Ezra's story was my story up until that day. On that same date, I had the absolute pleasure of a run-in with the hilariously and ironically named Michigan campus organization, SAFE, that's S-A-F-E, it's an acronym for the Students Allied for Freedom and Equality. Uh, in reality, SAFE is a radical leftist, anti-Semitic and pro-Islamist group 
that's an offshoot of the larger national Students for Justice in Palestine movement and their coalition of campus organizations. SAFE, otherwise famous in Ann Arbor, Michigan, for leading BDS efforts and petitioning the university to ban the film American Sniper from ever being shown on campus. Um, on this day, the day of Ezra Schwartz's cold-blooded murder at the hands of Palestinian terrorists in the Jewish state, SAFE elect decided to erect a mock Israeli-Palestinian checkpoint in the center of our campus. The protest included Arab students dressed in costumes as Israeli soldiers and two large walls graffitied with a dove in a sniper's crosshairs, a poorly drawn version of that notorious and childly dishonest series of four or five maps of Israel illustrating a fantasy of Palestinian land loss and Israel's supposed malfeasance. And, prom and prominently, front and center, the words in big red letters made to look like blood, uh, the phrase, to exist is to resist. And I approached the protesters that day in their IDF soldier costumes during my walk between classes and I objected to the use of that phrase in particular, that phrase to exist is to resist, because I believed it to be a plainly regressive way of looking at the conflict, no matter which side you are on. Resistance, oftentimes, is a code word for violence. That much is plain to everyone, especially these days. And to exist should not be to resist, but to coexist. And to exist to be to, do to dialogue, to compromise and to strive toward an eventual greater peace. And to reject those values is to threaten the existence of lives on both sides of the Israeli-Palestinian struggle. Certainly how I felt at the time, and I'm not quite sure I'm as optimistic anymore, but that was me at 19. Indeed, they were supporting and glorifying violence against Israel on the very day that Ezra had been murdered by someone who believed in that very same brand of nationalistic violence. It was hard not to feel that they were supporting and glorifying Ezra's murder, and that they would support and glorify my own murder, for Ezra's story could have been my own. We were one and the same. After this very brief encounter, the Michigan Central Student Government, the CSG, a body on which I served as an elected representative and the youngest member of at the time, called for an ethics probe to determine if I should be expelled from the university's student government at the urging of SAFE's leadership. In the first ethics committee investigation in the University of Michigan's history, despite the fact that CSG representatives had previously been arrested at violent protests and for other questionable activities, it is a college campus, SAFE members were publicly berating me for my racist views, blinding privilege, intolerant hate speech, and a personal favorite of mine, my physically threatening stature. I guess I was a lot scarier looking at age 19 and when I'm not hiding behind a webcam. Apparently my behavior, questioning through dialogue, the decision of a student group to promote and glorify violence, merited an unprecedented ethical review by my university, my public university. It is also noteworthy that one of the participants in the SAFE demonstration on that very same day was also an elected representative of CSG. Of course, there was no public ethics interrogation for her. How's that for a double standard? I was accused of failing to represent the views of all students by SAFE. And for that crime, I was ready and willing to plead guilty, for I was intent on representing the views of the students who had put me in that seat. That's not to say that I was acting in my capacity as a student government representative when I publicly condemned the protest, but it is to say that I would never apologize for questioning the taste, timing, and appropriateness of that rank display of Israel demonization. After being blindsided by the allegations at a meeting on the eve of Thanksgiving vacation, when all the other Jewish students in the assembly had already flown or driven home for break, I was a local, and over a months long investigatory process coincided with final exams and thorough examination of the video of the exchange, ironically recorded by members of SAFE themselves, I was eventually unanimously exonerated by the ethics committee 
As the footage showed, I did not engage in any form of intimidation, hate speech, or aggression. And despite the fact that it had happened on the same day as, fellow, as a fellow American Jewish student who was murdered by Palestinian jihadists, I conducted myself respectfully, though forcefully, as really should be a model for pro-Jewish and pro-Israel students nationally. While this humiliating, offensive, unfounded, and time-consuming investigation of my ethics for speaking freely as a student in opposition to a radical political protest should have never happened at a public university, it did. And similar events have continued to happen on campuses across the country over the course of the last five years, more times than I care to count for you tonight. I mean, seriously, this is what I said to Kobe Ares, who heads up the Michigan ZOA chapter and introduced me when he invited me to come speak for you folks tonight. How many times have you guys heard virtually this same story, this same crap and others like it? There's so many of them out there. I, I don't know why he asked me to come speak to this group again. Look, I borrowed large portions of this lecture from a speech I gave shortly after these events happened. And nothing's changed since then. Things seem only to have gotten worse. Illiberalism is out in full force, not just on our campuses, but in our newsrooms, our film studios, and our corporate boardrooms. Cancel culture is a cancer that just seems to get worse and worse with time. And while we're unwilling as a society to tolerate even the most minor of slights directed toward other minority factions, Jew hatred festers unchecked in the United States of America. And with the exception of some outlier groups like the ZOA, our community enables it by donating our dollars to feckless institutions that fail to protect our people and offering our overwhelming political support to spineless candidates who fail to defend our interests. The American Jewish community, which has a strong propensity toward political liberalism, must ensure that it is not complacent in this issue. Jewish students simply do not fight for their cause with the same dedication and passionate intensity that pro-Palestinian students do. It's a reality we have to reckon with. They are not well versed in the issues. This is a hard truth that I witnessed firsthand and I had confirmed by fellow pro-Israel advocates when, my time, when I was in college, and now political professionals throughout the country who have a focus in this space. The current administration, whatever you think of it in the broader scheme of things, has been damn good on this issue. President Trump issued an executive order in December of 2019 that reiterated that Title VI of the Civil Rights Act protects Jews, just as it does every other race, color, national origin, and ethnicity from discrimination at taxpayer-funded universities. It is very likely that at some point in the next year, a case seeking to solidify this protection for Jewish students could make its way to the highest courts of this country. And having an administration in power that recognizes the importance of protecting members of the Jewish nation, not just all other ethnic peoples, or rather just like all other ethnic peoples are protected, will be beneficial when it comes time to make that case. But fighting this battle in the political and judicial arenas are not enough. We need to fight more, most fiercely in the arena where we are being most brutally walloped today, the culture. In our culture, anti-Semitism is of zero concern to the masses. Despite the fact that FBI data regularly shows year after year that a terrifying disproportionate number of hate crimes are directed toward Jews in this country, the culture is not concerned with bigotry directed toward our people. Contrast the reactions we've seen to other forms of racism today with the lack thereof when visibly Jewish Hasidic men and women in Brooklyn were subject to beatings in the streets on a near daily basis just a few brief months ago. Just this week, Philadelphia Eagles star wide receiver Deshaun Jackson has been posting a plethora of unbridled Jew hatred to his Instagram page. He's disseminated falsified Hitler quotes that are typically used by Nazis to argue that Hitler was in fact not a racist. He's accused Jews of extorting America and pushing and pursuing a, a dominant, oh, 
apologies, and pursuing an agenda of world domination through the subjugation of blacks. And he's channeled many of Nation of Islam leader Louis Farrakhan's most despicable anti-Jewish rants from over the years. Let me ask you this. In a culture that is willing to cancel average Joes and call for terminating their employment because of off-color jokes discovered on their social media accounts from decades prior, or unsavory displays of road rage caught by someone with an iPhone, none of the usual suspects have made so much as a peep about Mr. Jackson's anti-Semitic bigotry. Why do you think that is? When New Orleans Saints quarterback Drew Brees suggested NFL players should stand for the national anthem just a few weeks prior to this, he was widely condemned by players and league officials, ultimately for forced to retract his comments and apologize profusely. No NFL player has yet to speak out against Jackson's praise for Hitler or charges of Jewish plans for world domination. Disparagement or even uneasiness towards so much as a single tenet of the large Black Lives Matter platform, which spans numerous issues, is grounds for public shaming and termination from your place of employment too. That's what happened last month, at Florida State University, where Jack Denton, the university student government president, had his private text messages leaked, where he acknowledged privately again to a group of fellow Catholic students that some tenets of the BLM platform were not in line with his faith, faith, such as support for abortion or transgenderism. The leaking of these texts, texts led to Denton's removal as Florida State's student government president shortly thereafter. Wait for this. His replacement was Ahmad Duraldic, a Palestinian anti-Semite who'd posted swastikas on his social media accounts, referred to Israel as a Nazi state, and publicly labeled Jews as stupid on his own social media and website. A vote of no confidence was brought forth against Duraldic, but it failed. Duraldic is serving his term without censure from the university. Jack Denton has been canceled. I don't think the ethics committee at the University of Michigan would exonerate me unanimously if the same event happened today. The culture is changing and it's a war that we, as opponents of a double standard for Jewish students and proponents of free speech generally, are losing. And we Jews are being beaten so uniquely badly because for the most part, we're not willing to take our cues from the state of Israel and defend ourselves proudly and properly. The lesson from our Israeli counterparts should be clear by now. Self-preservation comes first. Winning the popularity contest comes last. I just wanna go back briefly, back to my story at the University of Michigan because there's one aspect of it that I think this group might appreciate. For a good while, I sat on the University of Michigan Hillel's governing board. I worked for that in, with, with that organization in addition to serving on the student government for the larger university because I was passionate about cultivating a strong Jewish community at the school. But at a meeting on a Thursday, November 3rd, 2016, I was informed by the director of the University of Michigan Hillel that the Zionist Organization of America was effectively persona non grata at Michigan Hillel. I heard this organization, the ZOA, which had done so much for me throughout my ordeal, everything from providing counsel to access to professional communication consultants, should I need them, and continues to do so much for the U.S.'s relationship. I heard them compared with the far left organizations that support BDS movement and how it does not fit under Hillel's large pro-Israel tent, large pro-Israel tent. And since then, since that night in 2016, that same Hillel director has made room for those far left groups like J Street and the Jewish Voice for Peace within that tent, within the Ann Arbor Jewish community. And I don't know for certain, but I seriously doubt that the policy on ZOAs being welcome has changed so much as one iota. I was appalled to hear that a mainstream, longstanding and respected organization like the ZOA was no longer politically correct enough for Hillel. 
And frankly, I was disgusted to hear that the ZOA, for which my grandfather, Rabbi Milton Arm, Allah HaShalom and may he rest in peace, served as a local president many years ago, that that, that that organization and he weren't the right kind of Zionist for the Hillel in 2016. And I resigned from the Hillel governing board that evening. But look, like I noted previously, we've obviously got bigger issues than the internal politics of Jewish organizations. But if we want to change a pernicious culture nationally, we've got to work on improving ourselves. So with that, I posit that our biggest problem as a people is not our enemies, numerous as they are. It is our brethren who are either too ignorant, too fearful, or too self-effacing to speak out for what is rightfully ours, to stand up and to be heard. Thanks so much for inviting me on this call to speak tonight. Um, I'm happy to try and answer a few of your questions if you do have any, uh, but I can't promise I'll have answers half as good as what the folks at the ZOA are probably cooking up behind the scenes uh, as we speak. So thanks. And with that, I'll kick it back to, I guess, Kobe or Alan or whoever wants to speak now. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. So we, we do have a few questions. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, you know, we're, we're proud of you and uh, we wish uh, to have more, more students like you, more people like you who will, uh, will defend Israel and the Jewish people. So uh, there's a question here from one of our board members. Uh, um, if you can describe some of the intimidation and harassment acts uh, on campus that you went, uh, that you undergo during the student uh, investigation and also uh, during the uh, BDS um, vote uh, at University of Michigan. Uh, is, is there a lot of anti-Semitism there, anti-Israel sentiment, and how did, how did it come to uh, fruition? Yeah, I mean, I think I just talked a lot about it. Um, <laughs> there, there's obviously a lot of anti-Semitism on campuses, and frankly, I'm not sure I'm the best equipped to speak on it because I'm not on campuses anymore. And um, it's a lot worse now. Uh, from everything I'm reading, the, you know, the cases tick up. <laughs> and I'm not talking about COVID, I'm talking about this too. Um, and frankly, COVID and kids being away from campuses hasn't stopped these cases from ticking up. You know, that Florida State situation I described happened over a Zoom call, um, both of those student government meetings. So even as kids are not on campus, we're gonna continue to see a progressive movement like you spoke about earlier, Kobe that is um, frankly obsessed with having Jew on the brain. Um, we're not going to get equal treatment in the uh, public sphere with things operating, uh, you know, all things consistent. Uh, we're seeing that with the Deshaun Jackson thing now. We're seeing it with the Florida State instance. Um, what kind of intimidation tax did I, intimidation programs did I experience? Oh, everything from, you know, threatening emails to uh, threats to, you know, send messages to my, the, organ the campus organizations with which I was affiliated to try and get me kicked out of groups, obviously getting, you know, me kicked off of the student government, um, publicly shaming me, um, you know, posting things on social media about how I'm a bigot, I'm this, I'm that, and all of that's just gotten worse. And that means that, you know, what, what's to be gained for the average, you know, Jewish kid who's from, you know, Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, or, you know, you know, Long Island, New York, what's to be gained? You're at that school to learn. You're at that school to go through four years, get a degree, go work in business or medicine or law or whatever it is. Um, why involve yourself in these battles if all you have to do is lose? Um, and the answer, I think, is probably pretty clear to you and I, which is because culture matters. These wars matter because they'll follow us, you know, not just on, they're not isolated to the campus. They'll follow you to the the boardroom, they'll follow you to, you know, everywhere you go in your life. Um, and, in, and unless you want to be a person without principles, unless you want to be a person who doesn't care about anything and isn't willing to fight for anything, except for, you know, your parnasa, your, what you're going to make in your life. Um, the truth is, it doesn't make sense to, you know, attach your name publicly to a cause and fight back against the mob. Uh, what's important now, I think, uh, with kids on our campuses is teaching them why it's important to fight back against the mob, what the mob can do to them and their lives later on uh, if it goes unchecked, um, what a life where anti-Semitism is completely, you know, normal and normalized means for them. Um, 
and you know, it's the, to the credit of organizations like ZOA, who I believe are helping to provide students with those resources. I know you uh, provided me with those resources, so. Okay, so um, um, next, next question is, um, I guess, uh, I mean, it, it's an open-ended question, but, um, and I can, I can also um, answer a few, few after you. Um, why, do you why do you think that, uh, as you said now, Jewish students uh, just want to come and learn and study, but why do you think that um, Jewish students uh, are, are attracted uh, naturally to, to the, um, the social justice movements and to the progressive movements that are often uh, anti-Israel um, and what can be done to, to change it? Um, I think it's actually a pretty easy answer. I'm, you know, why is anybody attracted to doing things that everybody is doing? Uh, it, you know, why would you want to go join the minority faction of, you know, the three college Republicans in Ann Arbor and, you know, the three, you know, young Americans for freedom guys, you know, and the pro-life crowd when they're the only ones who are willing to support you on Israel. Um, not exactly the uh, sexiest bunch to squad up with I mean, when you're on a college campus. Um, every major corporation in America now toes the line on these progressive culture issues. You really expect Jewish, Jewish students on college campuses to buck the crowd because they care so much about Israel? No, they'll still take their birthright trip and you know, they'll, you know, they, they may not intimately become like an opponent of Israel. Some will, obviously. You got organizations like J Street and organizations like the Jewish Voice for Peace, which are actively trying to sow uh, hostility toward Israel and animosity of Israel within the Jewish community. But for the most part, you, you're just going to have a lot of apathetic kids. Um, and I don't know, I think, you know, we are going to have to make a pretty good case for why they should buck the establishment because progressive orthodoxy is the establishment on these campuses now. Right. So um, to add a little bit of uh, insight is um, the way I see it, um, is that if you look at, uh, you know, at Z-Way also part of what we do is we try to educate the younger generation even before they get to college, the college campus. Uh, we have a program that w where we teach uh, students how to advocate for Israel uh, when they get to campus so, they're, they don't, so they know what to answer so they're confident of who they are and what they believe in. Um, what, what happened in the past, uh, I would say 30 years, 40 years, is that the most of the Jewish establishment, I would say even with the religious, religious uh, Jewish establishment in the US um, made it that uh, Judaism basically becomes social justice. And then if you look, uh, one of the um, temples around us, um, it, if you go, it's a huge temple. And if you go near it, you will see a huge sign, the Birmingham temple, you will see a huge sign that says, Judaism is Black Lives Matter. Um, and so from a young age, what kids, uh, what kids learn, uh, it, whether it's, uh, it's, it's Jewish schools um, and later on uh, youth groups and so on, and even at shul, what they hear every time is that, uh, is about the social justice movement. And what happens now is that it becomes a religion, even if you don't want to call it a religion, if, even if uh, God is not mentioned in these movements. But what happens is it, it does become a religion. And once it become a, becomes a religion and you believe in it, then what happens if it contradicts something else that you believe in, um, uh, such as Israel or, or some, sometimes Jewish rights? So what happens is you, you justify, you justify um, um, the hate, um, and, and this is, this is how we end up, uh, where, where we are right now. Um, because the next question is, and I guess it's, uh, really for us is, is that, um, J student is very, um, present on, on college campuses. And so, um, uh, what is the way is doing about this? So it's a great question. Um, so for your, for those of you who don't know, J Street is heavily funded by um, by people like George Soros and um, some Iranian groups, Iranian foundations, and others, uh, with the intent to um, not only get the um, the American government to turn against Israel, but to also 
turn the Jewish people against Israel. Now, uh, we have a great campus department. The ZOA has a great uh, national campus department, and we have campus coordinators um, located in different places in the country. Uh, but what we and, and our, we want to invest in the future, and this is what we do right now, and this is our top priority, is to invest in the, ne in the next generation of, of, uh, of pro-Israel students. Uh, but for that, we, know, we need resources. In order to put a, a campus coordinator uh, full-time, it costs money. And, um, and that's where we need your help. We need your help with, uh, you know, your donations means another campus coordinator. Your donations means another, um, another kid who, who, another student who will travel to Israel to go to Judea and Samaria. We, ZOA is the only organization that uh, sends college students to Israel and sends them to Judea and Samaria and instills in them the pride uh, of, of, of who we are and, and, and what our country is about and our history with the country. Um, I think, let's see if we have one more question here. Okay, so I think uh, we have a few more questions, but I think it's, it's similar to what we had before. Um, so again, I wanna say, so for, for those of you who don't know, um, during the Holocaust, there was a, a, a person by the name of uh, uh, Peter Bergson. Um, if you, you can go look it up, it's called, the movie about him is called Against the Tide. And um, this individual, this young individual at the time, during the, the Holocaust, um, he was fighting the Jewish establishment in the U.S. Um, he fought the Jewish establishment that was very close to uh, President Roosevelt. And he, he begged them to, to try and open the, the gates to America and try to help um, uh, Jews escape Europe and for Americans and for the American army to, to pay more attention to, to, the, uh, to, to, what's, to the murder that has been, has been occurred, occurring in, in, in Europe. Um, not only that the Jewish establishment, uh, major Jewish establishment didn't help uh, Peter Bergson, but they also called him crazy and they said that he's, um, he's just uh, attracting unwanted attentions to, to Jews from the American government. The movie ag about him is called Against the Tide. And this is why it's very important today to talk about this because what we are doing today is we are going against the tide. Um, if, if you look, you can see a lot of people who, who are, who are pro-Israel and they're silent and they're silent because they don't, they feel like they don't have uh, the support of the Jewish establishment. I don't want to name names, but there are organizations that I've sp spoken to who, who refused, who we showed them quotes of anti-Semitic uh, uh, quotes from, from Black Lives Matter and uh, Black Lives Matter and others, and they refused to touch it and they refused to, to do anything about it. Just like uh, Jesse Arm said, uh, happened with him, with Hill at, uh, at uh, Metro Detroit. Um, and this is where we come, this is where you come. We are in a tough time right now. Um, the truth is, is hidden. And, and today, anti-Semitism hides behind, uh, ironically, the, the civil, civil rights movement and behind uh, progressiveness. So, this is where we, we come, this is where ZOA comes, and this is where we ask you to support us. And sometimes we're a lone voice. There are a handful of organizations who stand up for us right. Um, and um, so we, we ask you to, to continue your donations, continue your contribution, so we can continue help uh, students just like Jesse Arm. Let me see if we have one more question here. I, I see a pretty good question. Can I Go ask ahead. it in the, in the chat? Um, so uh, I'm just going to read it out loud here. Michael S. Goodman asks, there is a distinction between universities administration and student organizations. Student organizations and governments are in the hands of immature squabblers. Are they wor really worth bothering about? Um, and the answer is yes, because the immature squabblers go on to, you know, populate the opinion newsroom of the New York Times. Or the, or you know, the non-opinion, the news side newsroom of the New York Times, and um, I really like the question because I often ask myself the same one, uh, particularly in college after this ordeal kind of went down. Um, 
we have to fight these battles, particularly like on the student to student level. I really don't like, you know, one of the, one of the approaches at, at Hillel at Michigan, the way they wanted to tackle the BDS debate year after year was pretty much as follows. Um, all of the, you know, students who are a little too pro-Israel, the kids like me, uh, and there were, you know, a handful of us, none of them would speak uh, on behalf of the Hillel aligned or the anti-BDS side of things. Um, the Hillel director who I described previously would make sure that that wouldn't happen um, because, you know, she saw no value in countering what the uh, SAFE group or the Students for Justice in Palestine group on the University of Michigan's campus was doing in their debate for BDS. I mean, it wasn't really about passing BDS and really getting the University of Michigan, a public school, to divest its funds from its endowment, from any business that does work in Israel. That's not realistic. That's you know never going to happen. That puts the university at financial risk. What it was about, right, was getting a pulpit, getting in front of everyone, getting up on a podium and trashing Israel and telling all of your personal stories about you know the kids who can't see family or, you know, get stuck at Ben Gurion airport when they go to Israel and all of the hoops they have to jump through and the pain and, you know, the, make themselves really victims, make themselves, you know, feel like horrible, displaced indigenous people. And I don't know, I mean, the, the Hillel and the organizational Jewish approach at Michigan was always to counter that by, you know, letting them have their thing, fighting it by saying, okay, sure, you know, I understand your pain. I'm anti-settlement as well. I'm I have lots of issues with the Israeli government as well, but BDS is like one step too far and here's a really technical reason why, you know, no appeals to emotion. And my approach was always to say like, what do you mean displaced indigenous people? Like I'll talk to you about a displaced indigenous people and I'll tell you about my family's history and I'll tell you about, uh, you know, the hardship that Jews have experienced as well because all this really is is a battle uh, over semantics, you know, in, in a in a public arena, it's a facing contest. I mean, it's a, two sides get in there and they scream at each other about issues. And nothing's going to actually change or happen at the end of the day. This is a this is a continuing trend on in politics, not just in campus politics. Um, but it's about you know going up there and making a statement, fighting back. Uh, so yeah, student groups are worth bothering with, not because of the great power they yield, but because of the power some of them will go on to yield in corporate America and in political America. And also because, you know, when you've got 10% who feel one way and 10% who feel another way, you usually got 80% of people who don't really feel, you know, particularly strong one way or the other. But if all they're hearing is the 10% that's, you know, hitting all the progressive buzzwords and, you know, make, feels really impassioned about their cause, and the other 10%, which is the Jewish kids, you know, saying, oh yeah, sorry, we, we're sorry about Israel, but like, please don't do BDS because that's like one step too far. I mean, of course, if you're in that 80% group, you're just going to align with people that actually seem passionate and like want to be there because they're, you know, they're, they're fired up about their cause. Um, and that's, I mean, that's, again, to the credit of organizations like ZOA, I mean, you've got to be, you've got to be, it's not enough to oppose BDS <laughs> and pressure universities to, you know, not be, not, not endorse BDS. You've got to fight the double standard. You've got to fight, uh, the anti-Israel bigotry that comes out of these kids' mouths. Um, and you've got to get in the trenches and you've got to, you know, to some extent, you've got to, you've got to use your head with, with when it comes to communications too. You've got to use their code words. You've got to talk about how, you know, it, and, and it's, we're right, we're justified to say that, you know, Jews are also a displaced indigenous people that come from the Middle East. You know, we're not white interlopers. We're not, you know, uh, uh, colonialists, the terms they like to throw at us. Um, and, and that battle is, is absolutely worth fighting because of uh, what it means down the line. Okay, great. Um, so if, if you don't see any more questions, um, let me, uh, thank you, Jesse. That was uh, very insightful. Um, as always, uh, it's good to see you and hear you. Um, and uh, before I let everybody go, we have uh, really uh, exciting uh, events coming up. Tomorrow at 7 p.m. we have an uh, event uh, with the uh, Philadelphia region, entitled As I First Saw Israel, featuring z uh, Director, Deputy Director Howard uh, Katzoff. Um, we're going to have a link right now in the chat chat that you can join. Sunday, 11 a.m., uh, join z uh, second part mega sovereignty event. Again, z is pushing for sovereignty. Again, one of the uh, few organizations that is pushing for sovereignty. This is an historic moment. We're standing against uh, big forces and we're pushing for it. So 
Uh, we're going to have an event about it uh, on it Sunday at 11 a.m. Um, uh, with the uh, director of the uh, at the International Legal Forum um, and and uh, Knesset member Sharana Skell. Um, again, thank you everybody for uh, for showing up. Um, spread the word, and uh, and let's continue. Let's continue the fight. Let's continue the fight for what's right. Um, again, Jesse, thank you for for joining us, and uh, everybody stay safe. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.